By the year 2050, Africa's current population of 1.4 billion will have doubled, and a quarter of the entire world's population will be African. By 2100, one in three people will be African, and over half of the world's young people will be living in Africa. As the world quickly approaches 8 billion people, a common concern that has come up in conversation in recent years is the threat of overpopulation. Just how many people is too many for the limited amount of resources that our planet can provide? Well, as a matter of fact, the bigger concern should be the threat of a rapid population decline. Elon Musk has been pretty vocal about his concern of a declining population, with tweets going as far back as 2017, and most recently as 2022, calling it potentially the greatest risk to the future of human civilization. He's gotten a lot of backlash over the years related to these comments, with a lot of them centering around the fact that he's a billionaire, with a massive net worth that may or may not have been attained by exploiting the working class, and typically it is lower income families that have a lot of children who then end up in the working class for people like him to exploit. But the thing is, he might actually be right, because right now, over half of the world's countries don't have the necessary birth rate of 2.1 children per woman to naturally replace their population. Countries like China, Japan, Spain, Portugal, South Korea, and nearly 25 others will have reduced their population by half by the end of the century. And because of this, globally, we're going to see a 41% reduction in people under the age of 5 by 2100, and a 500% increase in people over the age of 80. So going back to the workforce, we are going to need a considerable amount of medical workers alone to look after the nearly 1 billion 80 year olds. But somewhere fertility is not a problem is Africa, where 53 of its 54 countries all have a birth rate of 2.2 or higher. In fact, less than 10 countries outside of Africa have a birth rate of 4.0 or higher, where 32 African countries have a birth rate of 4.5 or higher. So while the rest of the world's population begins to slide off, Africa's will be continuing to boom. Dr. Richard Horton said that the 21st century will see a revolution in the story of our human civilization. Africa and the Arab world will shape our future, while Europe and Asia will recede in their influence. By the end of the century, the world will be multipolar, with India, Nigeria, China, and the US the dominant powers. This will truly be a new world, one that we should be preparing for today. The population boom in Africa is going to give it one of, if not its most valuable resource, young people. Right now, in most African countries, 70% or more of the population is under the age of 30, a youth boom that is projected to only accelerate in the decades to come, and could propel the continent to new levels of economic and geopolitical power. Right now, the life expectancy in Africa as a whole is 64.5 years. North America is 79, and Europe is 78.5. So yes, on average right now, Africa is a bit lower than North America or Europe. However, most of Africa has made remarkable progress in the past few years, reducing mortality, especially in recent years as improvements in nutrition, sanitation, and measures to combat malaria and other tropical diseases have led to substantial increases in lifespan. On top of that, they've reduced infant mortality by 29% over the past few years, with some of the standout countries being Ethiopia, who has reduced infant mortality by 41%, Rwanda, who has reduced it by 51%, Congo, 43%, and Botswana, 46%. And as the continent continues to develop in progress, these numbers are only gonna increase. But for a massive population boom to help the economy and not cripple it, you need to do three things. The first, which may sound a little contradictory, is you need to lower the fertility rate so that the dependency ratio, which is the number of children who need to be supported by working adults, falls. With more people of the working age, rather than being children, output per person can rise sharply, savings will be increased for investment, and more money can be invested in education and training for each child. You also need to heavily invest in education. In recent years, there has been a significant investment into education in African countries, but the main focus has been on primary education, leaving a significant gap in secondary education, especially when it comes to girls. For girls, it appears that secondary education is the critical arena for reducing fertility. Girls who leave school after primary education, which ends at the age of 12, are readily available for early marriage and have no distinctive skills that allow them to be more productive or stand up to their husbands. Compared to women who complete high school, who are unlikely to marry before the age of 18, and they emerge with greater confidence and skills that allow them to shape their own fertility and make greater economic contributions to their families. As of right now, while considerable progress has been made in female primary education, there is a substantial gap when it comes to female secondary education. Even in countries where female primary attendance is over 80%, female secondary attendance falls to 25% or less. I found this quote in an article that I really liked. It said that indeed, among the literally billions of Africans who will be born in the 21st century, there are no doubt future Mozarts, Einsteins, Salks, and Picassos, as well as brilliant performers, 
writers, and thinkers of all kinds. To deprive the world of that talent by lack of education and opportunity would be a tragedy for all of mankind. And to really harness this full potential, the goal should be 100% attendance for both boys and girls in secondary education. And finally, as more and more countries begin to urbanize, there needs to be an influx in labor-based jobs like manufacturing. This is exactly how China was able to develop so quickly, because the US was outsourcing all of their manufacturing jobs to China, who was then able to reinvest in themselves. China is now outsourcing their manufacturing work and building infrastructure in over 35 African countries. While China has taken a dominant role in Africa's investment, the US and European countries have taken a more passive role, which a number of economists have said is a major mistake if they want to maintain their global importance. Africa shouldn't be overlooked or looked at like competition, they should be viewed as an opportunity and a future ally, one that might be able to help you out when your country no longer has the workforce to sustain itself. Because by 2070, Africa will have a larger workforce than the US, China, and India combined. One of the major problems that Africa will face over the remainder of the century is going to be climate change. Not only will Africa be one of the worst hit continents by climate change, but over the next century they're going to be one of the worst contributors as well. Up until recently, due to poverty and its mainly rural population, Africa was not a major contributor to CO2 emissions at all, and in 2016 the entire continent produced less CO2 than the country of Russia. But their CO2 emissions per person has been increasing rapidly, a lot faster than its population. Africa needs to be put on the path of solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, and nuclear power for its fuel needs. Otherwise, it's going to be nearly impossible for other countries to make a significant impact on reducing global CO2 emissions. Fortunately, Africa has plenty of wind, hydro, uranium, and solar resources, but unfortunately, with the backing of foreign capital, mainly from China, over 100 coal-powered electric plants are in various stages of planning or development in Africa right now. To put it another way, if by 2060, Africa achieves the same emissions level per person as India today, then even if China, the United States, India, Russia, Japan, and Germany were all to cut their CO2 emissions by 20%, that would not offset the increase to CO2 output from Africa. Another problem that was addressed a lot in the comment section of my TikTok video was African governments. It's very common in developing nations, and developed nations, let's be real, <laughs> for corruption to take place. But there has been a rise in continuing resilience of political optimism among African voters, especially the youth, who are an overwhelmingly supportive of democracy. Their optimism has been in helped part by the rise of an aggressively independent media, the maturing of institutions, and by the explosion of non-governmental organizations fighting to hold governments accountable despite increasingly restrictive conditions. In several countries, institutions that were once firmly under the thumb of elites are showing glimmers of independence, from the media, including social media, to the church and the judiciary. In the long term, demographic shifts make democratic change seem inevitable. Africa's population is the youngest, fastest growing, and in many places, the most rapidly urbanizing on the planet. The individuals driving this youth bulge are increasingly globalized in their aspirations, more digitally savvy than preceding generations, and far more impatient with authoritarian leaders. Speaking of being digitally savvy, did you know that there is currently a huge tech boom taking place in Africa right now that is set to shake up a four trillion dollar industry. Countries like Nigeria, South Africa, Morocco, Egypt, and Kenya were all listed as some of the most thriving breeding grounds for developing technology centers. Lots of money is going into this and it's predicted that Africa will soon be taking over San Francisco's place as the future global hub of technology. On the topic of technology, Africa is also the fastest growing crypto market among developing economies and saw a 1200% increase in crypto payments between 2020 and 2021. Kenya, South Africa and Nigeria are all also in the top 10 countries globally for crypto use. So why is this important? Well, crypto has the potential to revolutionize and change the financial industry forever. But some of the biggest pushback in more developed nations is going to be from governments and central banks. Africa, however, remains the most unbanked continent in the world, with 65% of its population being bankless, but 55% have a mobile phone. Akon, who is currently building a futuristic crypto city in Senegal, describes Africa as a leapfrog generation, one who missed out on landlines and computers and went straight to mobile phones and mobile payments. He went on to say that Africa is one of the only places in the world that can start from scratch and implement every new technological development and invention coming to fruition today without the need to break down existing infrastructure. Major countries and regions, from the US to Europe to China, can't deploy the latest technologies without having to demolish and reconstruct everything that's already been built. That's why Africa can lead the crypto and blockchain charge. At the end of the day, it's not going to be all roses and daisies for Africa, and there is a lot of work that needs to be done over the rest of the century related to governments, climate change, and education, but there's not too many things more powerful than a large group of young people who are hoping and fighting for positive change. Throughout our history, 
Empires have risen and fallen across the world for as long as humans have been around, and will most likely to continue to do so for as long as we're here. The world is evolving, and it's important to recognize new opportunities and do what you can do to support them, or else you're going to be left behind. That is all for this video. I really appreciate you sticking around until the end, and if you've made it this far, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe. Thank you.